Hello, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Royal Photographic Society and the latest in the series of talks from recent award recipients and bursary recipients. It's a pleasure this evening to hand over to our awards manager, Joe McDonald, who will introduce our speakers this evening. Over to you, Joe. Thanks, Michael. Welcome to tonight's conversation between Owen Harvey and Roger Tooth. And I'm sorry, my camera's going mad. Owen received the Joan Wakelin bursary in 2022. Owen uses photography as a tool to explore the world around him through storytelling and performance. Roger Tooth is former head of photography at The Guardian and judges the Joan Wakelin bursary every year with Fiona Shields, the Garden's Guardian's present head of photography. We will follow the conversation with Q&A. Over to you, Roger and Owen. Uh, thanks very much, Joe, and um, thanks everybody for tuning in to this um, uh, little chat with uh, Owen Harvey. Um, I'd just like to say congratulations, Owen, on your, you know, the great work you did for the bursary. And um, uh, it was, a, you know, a really good submission and a really interesting idea. And uh, we were really confident that you'd produce some great stuff, and you sure did. And um, I think... Should we just start with you talking through um, some of the work you did on bullfighting for the bursary? Sure, yeah. Um, thanks, Roger. And um, thanks to the RPS for hosting this tonight. Um, and thanks to those who have tuned in. Um, so the work I made, um, for those who are members of the RPS would have seen it originally, it was um, printed in the magazine. Um, it also ran at the, on The Guardian, and it was about... Um, young bullfighters really and their future in bullfighting or potentially not their future depending on the future of bullfighting uh in general um and what i was sort of interested in is exploring um what that means this generation of uh young men mainly i focused on um if bullfighting is to be banned um and sort of a lot of my work um focuses on the idea of belonging and um this very much sort of fits into that work so i'll quickly flick through some of these pictures um just so you get an idea of the images if you haven't seen them before um so the first trip was uh to malaga where i went to a bullfighting school where sort of kids between 16 to 18 learn how to become bullfighters um and it's usually a sort of a three-year course where they also do this alongside school or college. Um, obviously, it's become more and more of a niche sort of, um, I don't really call it a sport, but and they don't call it a sport either, um, but that's what some people refer it to. Um, and I was sort of, so I went to Malaga at uh, the start, and then I ended up going to um, a place called Hyam, um, Montoro, um and Rhonda so the sort of projects evolved over time um and I photographed many different people some people sort of for example this chap David Fuentes who this is photographed in his grandfather's home and he's from a sort of long lineage of bullfighters and then other people purely you know at school this is another chap called Antonio he's at the church um I'll just flip through some of these and then I'll pass over back to you Roger um, so that's a small selection of the work, just so you get an idea of it. Yeah, and, uh, as you can see, you know, it is uh, really wonderful. Um, should we um, go back to the beginning then? And, and um, you know, do you, do you want to tell us how your photographic journey, as they say on Strictly, how, do, how it started off? You know, were you always interested in photography or did you fall into it a bit like what I did? Um, sure. Um... Yeah, I'd say I very much fell into photography, really. Um, I was originally playing music for a long time. Um, that was sort of my first love, really, um, and still is, to be honest. Um, and then sort of started taking pictures when I was around. I guess I was quite late to come into it um, to some level. I, I kind of started taking pictures, playing with taking pictures um, around 18 and then kind of took it more seriously, I guess, around 20. Um, so I've been doing it now for 14 years. Um, and yeah, it kind of, to be honest, the first pictures that I saw that really excited me was being introduced to them through music, which was the pictures of um, 
the booklet from Quadrophenia by a photographer called Ethan Russell. Um, and they were essentially fictional documentary pictures of a, um, of a well, for those who haven't seen Quadrophenia, of a chap. And it sort of follows this guy through his upbringing and through him being, I guess, teenage to early adulthood. And um, those pictures really resonated with me. And that was my first introduction to photography. And after I saw those, I was kind of really hooked to photography, really. So, yeah, it was kind of accidental, free music, that I was then introduced to photography. And um, so you ended up going to college in Newport in the end. Yeah. Um, I gather you almost didn't go. Yeah, that's true. Um, so I was kind of... Uh, the option was to continue trying to play music, um, which, for one reason or another, I guess was... Is, is a difficult career as well in itself um and then the opportunity came up to sort of I'd gone to college to West Hearts um in Watford and studied photography there and then the opportunity came to potentially go to university and I wasn't going to go um and then I think I booked a train ticket to Newport in Wales the day before or I think at the time actually my mum did forced me to go up and do the interview um and I did the interview and I got placed there. Um, didn't really have any good pictures to show at the time, but uh, talked quite passionately, uh, probably, I guess, about um, what pictures I did like. And I think that was enough of reason for them to kind of give me a place on the course. Um, so that's really where then photography became a little more serious for me, where I started seeing more photographers that I thought were great and learning more photog about photography through the lecturers there, um, Ken Grant and Paul Rees uh, and Clive Landon. So those three sort of lecturers were the ones who really gave me more of a formal education in photography. So why did you, why do you think you chose a uh, documentary photography and not portraiture, you know, say photographing rock stars or photographing musicians? What, 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 why do you think you went into documentary work? Uh, well, I've, I think through music as well, the, the main thing that I was always interested in really was the storytelling aspect of it. Uh, a lot of the musicians I liked, um, still like to this day, have got a storytelling elements to their mus musicality anyway, ly lyrically. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess photography was just another way of having a voice. And I was kind of always interested in other people anyway. Mm -hmm. Um you know, so it was just a vehicle to be introduced to people, really. And you, and you, you've, and you've kind of stuck with photographing people, um, sort yeah. Of tribe, tribe, collecting tribes, if you like, and things like that. Collecting people rather than collecting things. Sure. Yeah, I think um, it's it's interesting because I think as a photographer or as any art form, you go through so much of a stage of trying to work out what it is you're trying to say. Um, and sometimes it's the most simple thing and I think quite a lot of my work I've just realised it's just about how people find a sense of belonging um, and I think that's probably I guess it's such a universe, universal feeling isn't it that people um, sort of long for this sense of belonging and I guess that's the overall arching umbrella of what all the work fits under and then I've sort of focused through subcultures and different get groups of people who are sort of really um find a sense of belonging in their groups yeah as a as a, as a student what sort of group were you in do you think which uh part of the subculture you, you know, or, or uh, hover over all of them or... <laughs> yeah i guess so i well i grew up listening to lots of hip-hop music and then a lot of rock music and then i played I played in the band as i said and so i was kind of super into rock music really um so that sense of tribalism, I, I guess, was something that I was introduced to from quite an early age as well from my dad. He was hugely into football. Um, right. He used to tell me a lot of stories about going down to uh, watch Chelsea when he was sort of 17, 18, 19, et cetera. So, and, I, and then I started going down to see a team called Wildstone, who were a non-league team when I was sort of 10 or 11. And I'd hear a lot of stories about the older sort of blokes down there who had belonged to different football teams when they were younger and everything that was intertwined with that. So I guess that storytelling nature, again, I was introduced to from quite an early age and that was kind of always what excited me and interested me. So, um, yeah, that was a sort of, I guess, the introduction and the appeal of storytelling. 
Yeah. So um, apart from the, you know, the college tutors, um, who else was, were early influences on you, do you think? Um, were you aware of other people? Were you aware of other photographers' work? Um, I guess, as I said, that those early Ethan Russell pictures, but I didn't know who Ethan Russell was at the time. I knew who the Who were, and I knew what Cod the album Quadrophenia, you know, but mm. uh, just that my dad owned that vinyl, and then I looked through the booklet, and I was pretty amazed by those pictures. Um, so I didn't really even understand that I was looking at photography, really, or that there was any such tool as documentary photography. I just knew that I was at the time 14 and those pictures resonated with me and excited me. Yeah. But all of my heroes really were rock stars, you know, like, <laughs> like a lot of kids, I guess I was kind of obsessed with um, guitar music and rap music and anything that had a bit of emotion in and had the, um, and also even folk music, you know, I love people like Neil Young and, all these different musicians who and yeah. Marvin Gaye and all you know what's going on is still one of my favorite albums all these albums that had an ability to tell a story or make social commentary that I found really exciting yeah um, so they were the people who introduced me to I guess art in a more wide scope yeah so you did so you did your, th your um, three years at um, Newport you, ca you came out as a uh, fresh young photographer how did you make ends meet how did you pay the rent or buy film uh, was it film or digital in those days by the way i should should ask you that so at university i shoot in film and i continue to shoot film so i'll flick down to some of that work actually that i yeah, made sure. um so this was the work that i started making at university which was all about the mod scene and this was just because i I guess I've gone to school with a lot of guys um, who are really into this scene still, the revival of it. So I started taking these pictures, um, I guess, of people who are influenced by late 1950s, 60s culture. And again, kind of found their belonging in this subculture, which I thought was really interesting. And I was kind of hooked at that point. Again, there was some relativity to music. As I'll flick through some of these quickly. Um and I continued shooting film. So this is some of the work from then. And then after that, I ended up shooting projects on, looking through some of this, um, on skinheads in the UK, again, of, of the adaption of what skinhead was uh, in, this would have been 10 years ago now, nine years ago. Mm. Um, and again, photographed this different subcultural group that I found pretty fascinating and interesting. Um and sort of went up and down the whole country doing it. And this, again, was all shot on film. Um, and to your question, I guess, how was it funded? When I was at uni, it was funded by a um, student loan. Um, and then when I left uni, it was funded. I went to work at a, a lab, a photo lab called Metro Imaging. Oh, yeah, Metro, yeah. Um, it was the mecca of E6 processing, wasn't it? Exactly, yeah. And then, which was great. It was a real education for me. I learned a lot mm. about film processing. Uh, you know, a lot of photographers used to come in and get their negs scanned from people like David Bailey, Mario Testino, um, you know, big fashion photographers and big documentary photographers. And that was so exciting to me and so inspiring to see all of that coming in. Um, so I used to be able to look through some of their contact sheets, which I thought was great, you know. Not that I probably should have been, but that was a great education. Um, and that sort of led me to inspire me to want to take more of my pictures. So I was working there at the time four days a week. And then I could have any day I wanted of the week off, which was a great setup. So they were very supportive of me taking pictures. So then I'd be able to do maybe one job a week or just one shoot, personal shoot a week at least. And then I'd also shoot on the weekends. Um, so I was trying to balance having an income from work and while still making new work. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I stayed there for I think three years because they were doing my processing for free which was a massive bonus um, yes yeah, yeah. and then I left in 2016 and um, went full-time freelance so and you're so you're um how does your professional and personal work sort of split I mean I, I, presumably your if you do advertising work that kind of pays the bills and then your personal work, do you aim that at um, uh, the press or whatever, or, or, or sorry, kind of publishers, editorial, or or do you just keep that personal? 
Uh, yeah, so the personal work is obviously self-funded, self-motivated, of course. Um, and then the large majority of the time I work on stories that I'm just really interested in doing that, again, are sort of all sort of adding up under this umbrella of work that I want to make. Um, and then occasionally I'll pitch them to online magazines or in print magazines and I'll use them as a tool to get press um, or just to get eyes on the work, um, which is great. And then the other part of my photography yeah, is the commercial work that I do, which I guess I don't talk about so much because that's what pays the bills, you know, and that's what allows me to continue making this work and funds this work being made. So, um, so yeah, it's a real split, I guess. I could try to keep one foot in the commercial world and one foot in the yeah. art world, just to speak. Is that commercial world, world mostly digital now and the personal work on film still or both is digital now i'm shooting digitally so so this is more recent work this is in 2023 actually so this was this year this is all out in la um photographing low riding culture um this was all shot digitally um and obviously all the bullfighting work that i showed at the very start that's all digital as well and then all of the because film is so expensive now and, and actually i find yeah. digital pretty liberating because you can just shoot a lot. You can see what you're making as you go. Um, it's just changed the way I make pictures, really, in a good way, I think. And it's become more exciting. And so, yeah, I'm shooting digitally now, um, which I really love. And it's just, it just took a while to sort of, I guess it was a change. Um, but I like, you know, it's been a good change, I think. And so I've been making this work over 2023, as mentioned. And yeah, and commercially, I'm 90 nine if not 100 percent of the time shooting digitally as well now yeah okay um so um uh <laughs> i can't think of the now so the um your uh oh uh, yeah i know what i was gonna say sorry just for the geeks out there yes, sir. are you nikon or, or 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 canon or indeed hasselblad i guess or something else well, at the first, at the start, I was just using a Bronica SQA, which was, oh, uh, yeah. you know, one of those old medium yeah. format cameras, which were fairly inexpensive. I mean, it used to jam constantly on me and break all the time. And I think I, it was a bit like Trigger's Broom from Only Fools and Horses. I think I, I replaced the um, the handle and the brush about 15 different times, respectively. So I changed the back of the camera and the lens of the camera every about every eight weeks because it was kept breaking. And then after a while, I just sort of realised that I'd spent about 10 times the cost of the actual camera on just different parts of the camera, getting it replaced. So until it was probably a new camera about seven times. Um, and then after that, I just thought, oh, it's ridiculous to keep doing this. Um, and then I was also using, at that point, I think a, just a Nikon F80 for a, a 35 millimeter camera. Um mm. But I've, I've never really been that interested in equipment, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, not shooting on a Canon. Uh, but, you know, as someone said, I can't think of who said it, but I've, I'm a firm believer of probably the best the best camera is the one you've got in your hand, right, at the right Sorry, time. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, so it doesn't really bother me. If I had an iPhone, if I had a, a camera that was big enough to make a print with, then, you know, that's yeah. what I'd be excited about using. Yeah. Do, do, do you actually find it more relaxing not to have a commission, I mean, for your personal work? Or, uh, I mean, I know having a commission sort of helps cash-wise, but... Yeah. Um, I think they're, they're quite different processes. When I'm working commercially, I'm working usually with a big team. Um, you know, there'll be a DG and then one or two lighting assistants, um, you know, and there'll be producers involved and everything is a lot more sort of um i guess there's less um there's less open um i can't think of the word here there's less sort of ability for things to go wrong but equally for things to surprise you because everything yeah, is so very, yeah it's all very planned i guess isn't it you're very planned yeah when, when you're oh, dealing with a team Exactly. It's a huge team effort. And when you're dealing with, I guess, bigger advertising budgets, um, there's less risk, 
involved. They don't, you know, people don't want to take any risks because there's big production budgets being involved. Um, whilst the personal work, you know, usually I'm just going around by myself with a camera. Yeah. That's kind of a more organic way of making work, I guess. Yeah. And did you, I mean, the LA stuff, did you send yourself there or? Was yeah. That so LA, I went out there for two months over the summer. Right. Uh, which was amazing. Got the opportunity to stay at someone's house there um, and thought, okay, great. Well, um, I'm really a firm believer in the importance of making personal work. So, you know, if it means being away for two months and making the work, then I'll, you know, go and do it. And um, because I think it's very easy to, to suddenly lose track of why you want to take pictures. I think if you're just doing commercial work, um, yeah. And I think for me, personal work is so important. And I've always seen, you know, whether it be photography or whether it be music or whether it be, you know, painting or whatever it might be, it's just a means for expression, really, and to explore ideas that I've been thinking about or things that I'm interested in. Yeah. Um, and sometimes commercial work doesn't offer those same opportunities to explore the things you're interested in because you're exploring something else for someone else, usually. On their behalf. Exactly. Yeah. So if you go and see a commercial client, would you take your personal work so they can see, you know, what they might, and, and, and that actually might spark something off to them, or, you know, they might use you in a different way, perhaps. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've like got, that? Yeah, 100%. I've got a portfolio that I take out, and um, that has a lot of personal work in and some commercial work, but I try and keep that portfolio about 90% personal work, actually. Interesting, yeah. Um, because for me, I, I just think, um, hopefully, although clients, I believe, seems these days want to take less and less risk, um, but I, I do think that it's important for them to understand your voice as a photographer and what you're interested in and what you're excited by mm. and hopefully see how it can translate to a commercial job. Hmm. And I think if you're dealing with smart, intelligent art buyers and or smart creative producers, they, they can link the two together, you know, they can understand yeah, yeah. that and translate. Yeah. And that's not my job to do, that's their job to do. In some respects, I, I make it as easy as possible for them to do that. But it's, you know, it's up to them to say, okay, well, you know, same as a picture editor at a magazine, right? Like, uh, oh, you know, which you have experience in and hmm. you're probably better off to answer this than me. But when you look at a photographer's book, hopefully you look at it and you, uh, and maybe you see something in it and you think, okay, this person would be very good at photographing this type of person, for example. Yeah, I think it's a huge um, benefit to have the photographer interest in the subject they're photographing. I mean, you know, the simple example is sport. Yeah, you know, most good sports photographers are sport nuts anyway. You know, they'd be on the, they, you know, they'd be at a, cri- at a a football match on a on a Saturday afternoon if they weren't taking pictures anyway. You know, I think those, and I, and I think they're the happiest photographers as well. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, everyone's got like one dream person that they can, they could photograph, right? And I, I guess if the, if the picture editor can almost guess who those people might be from looking at the, the yeah. portfolio, then something's clicking, I guess. Yeah. So it, it's all about people for you, isn't it? Because I noticed actually, just about every frame from your bullfighting um, folio had people in it, you know, had a person in it. Even if it was a costume, there was a person actually in the costume. Um, yeah, yeah. I get, there's some in the wider edit. I've shown quite a small edit of it yeah. earlier in this conversation. In the wider edit, there's a, a few more details, etc., and a couple of landscapes. Um, but ultimately, what I'm interested in is, is I find it hard to to photograph um still objects i'm i'm much more interested in the conversation with people and that's what i'm interested in is the exchange really the picture is i I know it sounds strange but the picture is just the result of of the conversation or of the exchange that's what i'm excited by i'm excited by meeting people who live you know different lives than i do and by learning about how different people live and and as I said, you know, it might be be quite happy just to write a, a page of text about that person, right? Or just, or just, or just to think about them, you know. But it's just 
or have a jamming session with them, I guess. Yeah, anything. <laughs> yeah, it's just the fact that I've got a camera and I can take a picture of them that they're kind of, in some ways, it's just like a strange diary for me, really. It just enables yeah. me to to reflect on it and just to, you know, it's just a nice way of putting my thoughts on paper as such. Yeah. That's a really good attitude, I think. What about um, video or film or moving yeah. images? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I love moving images. I love, um, I was talking to someone about this the other day, actually, a good friend of mine, um, about really how, how lim- the limitations of photography are so funny. Yeah. Um, and, you know, for me, music's always been the strongest art form. I think music is the most universal art form as well um you know anyone can sort of listen to music and tap their foot or feel something not many people photography in in a lot of ways is quite niche isn't it you know most people look at photography in the setting of because it's presented to them in in a newspaper or in a magazine or on a billboard not many people go out and buy photo books it's much more of a small audience than for example people that would stream music or go out and buy a vinyl or an album um but I think also that's what makes photography so great, isn't it? It's the limitations. Um, and I think cinema, going back to your question, a moving image, it's something I've always been really excited by. Um, I'm also slightly terrified of because I find it hard enough to to channel all my thinking in photography and how I'm and what I want to say with it in five years' time and in 10 years' time and you know, how that can develop over a long lasting career and and hopefully leave something behind that has um, uniformity to and that makes sense and one project sort of latches onto the other and mm. which I'm kind of and developing something that maybe has a lot of depth to it and a long period over a long period of time. Mm. And I think if you're also to mix speech into that and music into that and and all these other things that cinema has, then, you know, maybe the limitations of photography is the strongest thing about it, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I think things perhaps changed a bit. I mean, I, I I suppose I spent the last 10 years of my working life or professional life thinking about how to get photographers to shoot video for websites and things like that. Mm. And now I wonder if we've reached a stage where there is a, you know, the diversion is, is divergence is still there, really. And still photography is, is something different from from video. You know, it was always the thing, you know, people used to say to me, well, can't your, your photographers have video cameras and we can just take some stills off them, you know, for the paper or for the website. But obviously that never happened, thank yeah. goodness. But um, I just want to, that's now almost set in stone, really. And and it is, it is going to continue to be a completely different thing. I mean, presumably you, you see quite a long career for yourself in still photography and not having to shoot videos for you know, websites and things like that yeah well i've directed some video for advertising um and i would like to do to go back on that saying i, I say i'm frightened about doing video i'm frightened about doing most things you know like most people are um the idea of yeah. potentially one day shooting a, a you know feature film or and exploring some of the subject matters that I've explored in my photography is exciting of course um do I think that nowadays you you need to do both yes I do probably um do I think that they are very very different art forms though yeah I do as well so you know and I think sometimes people are trying to you know say oh you can do that and you can you could also do this I do think you know a, a great director isn't potentially a great photographer and I think vice versa you know it's a it's a there's some interchangeable skills there but it's essentially a different it's like a great a great rock guitar player isn't a great folk guitar player it's two different yeah they can both play the guitar but it's a different way of communicating isn't it I guess yeah I think we were talking about tribes and the thing about being a collector Mm. um do you see yourself as a bit of a collector of, of, of I mean, you know, a bit like, you know, Martin Parr is an amazing collector of things as well as people. Yeah. Uh, do you, you see yourself? Yeah, I'm a, a yeah. funny you say that. Yeah, I'm a big collector. Um, 
collect a lot. I collect a lot of photo books, obviously. That's a, the obvious collection thing. I also, maybe you're uh, un- uncovering my most geekiness here, but I also am a collector of uh, 50Ps, limited edition 50Ps, which I find uh, very exciting. <laughs> and uh, Yeah, I'm also very OCD. Um, I'm, I'm slightly obsessive about certain things. Very obsessive, yeah. I was very obsessive about music when I first started playing guitar. I was probably playing for, I don't know, if, well, from when I get home from school until I went to bed, really. Um, and then and then photography came in. I got involved with photography and then I became completely obsessive for that. And, you know, I, I'd, I'd say I spend like 95% of my time thinking about photography. <laughs> even if i'm not shooting i'm i'm at home thinking about it or yeah. you know writing ideas down or you know wondering about what i could do next or going back and looking at work that i've already made or or looking at other people's work and do you, you, know, do you, do you think that obsession or obsessiveness has made you a good technician i mean are you are you pretty picky about you know how your stuff is printed or uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, printing, I've always had quite good knowledge of because I worked at Metro. So that yeah. was, again, it was a great education. And then um, in some respects, f- for good and for bad, I didn't do a huge amount of assisting. I, again, yeah. as I said, I was kind of like more fascinated with the idea of just meeting people and storytelling. Yeah. So actually the that sort of led to my interest in photography and then the technical stuff came a little bit later when I realized that actually I was just holding myself back by not knowing that stuff yeah um that's always a actually, worry though, isn't it isn't it I think definitely. especially if you've been on a college course and you know you think you might have a completely rounded education but there's so much technical stuff that probably isn't covered yeah and and I definitely found that was the case when um when I left union and started to to make work independently or more independently mm. and then i thought you know you know if oh if only i knew a little bit more about that then i i would have got a better picture there you know mm. and then i just self-educated a lot so now i've become pretty geeky about it all um and i kind of got really into studying more about you know all the fundamentals of photography light color perspective emotion use of motion all these things you know that i think about now a huge amount because that's the fundamentals if you haven't if you can't think about that then you're not going to make good pictures yeah you know they're the they're the building blocks aren't they i guess yeah actually i went and and saw the taylor westing show yesterday so i thought it'd be polite to see your picture on a wall and which is obviously really nice but i just i felt that a lot a lot of the pictures did lack technique actually and a lot of the they seem to look very flat to me as if photographers aren't that aware of, <clears throat> aware of light anymore because they're using digital cameras that just handle any light if you like and I, I, I just struck me just walking around all the pictures but they're obviously some really nice work but a lot of them seem quite flat but as if the photographer wasn't aware of the light or the quality of the light but, I think uh, throughout the history of photography there's there's um there's become different there's different there's been different themes hasn't there and i think we're at a stage now where i think there's so much so much photography being made um and there's so much importance of the themes that are being explored in photography that sometimes that overwrites the technicality of the photograph and whether that's right or wrong i think you know there's there's pros to that and there's minuses, but essentially for me, a good picture can stand by itself and it can, and it can sing, you know, and ultimately the things that our eyes are drawn to will never change in photography. I think, and that's usually, again, it comes down to those fundamentals, doesn't it? Photography. And we and what I find interesting, um, I do a little bit of lecturing and, so many of the students that I sometimes teach now, they they have um, these ideas and and then they don't sort of, they aren't interested in photographing or focusing on things that are necessarily visual. And that always interests me because ultimately we're working in a visual medium, aren't we? So I always say to them, make your life easy, you know, 
pick something that can actually be told as a visual story. Yeah. And, and I think maybe that's the case. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but maybe that's the case in some of these these uh, exhibitions now is that sometimes it's a little bit of um, kind of concept. Yeah. Over, over. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I, I, I just judged a, a documentary award last month and quite a few of the ent ent entrants were trying to photograph feelings yeah and how they felt and that basically because of mental health being a big deal now I guess yeah being talked about so they're trying to sort of photograph mental health which I think is really hard thing to find I think they succeeded really you know but, yeah so it's a uh, like I was saying yeah really hard thing to sort of focus on isn't it these sort yeah, of ideas of, so. yeah unless you, you know I was always I came to that really um that sort of conclusion about photography really early when I was at Newport that I wanted to focus on things that I could actually you know photograph in my eyes beautifully Basically see <laughs> yeah, that I could see you know that I was interested in yeah. that, um, that's probably is quite a good direction to take isn't it <laughs> I think so what's um so what's the, your best advice to a, a young photographer or indeed anyone who enjoys having a camera in their hand? Have you got any advice on best advice? Um, I think uh, best advice. It's really tricky, isn't it? I think firstly, the most important thing, hundred percent, is just to photograph things that you're passionate about and you and you genuinely care about. Yeah, because I think if you don't do that then you are, you know, you. what's the point? You know, who if the work's not for you, then who is it for? Yeah. Um, so that's firstly my, would be a, my, if someone said that to me, I think I'd listen. Uh, secondly, well, I think that's the main one, you know, and I think also it's just about patience, isn't it? And I think good work takes time um, to sort of get under the skin of it. A little bit more you know that for example the bullfighting work uh because of the the bursary from the joanne wakeland um prize um i was kind of able to go out and start that work but um you know came back and that was published that was brilliant um but i always knew that 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 work could progress and it could go in deeper so i've done another three or four trips since then uh to continue well, making the work and, and i'll continue bullfighters or just make Spain, sort of Spanish life, or no, all bullfighting. So oh, really, like focusing on that, you know, and um, and it takes time. And I think all of the photographers that I've admired and and still admire now are photographers that have a depth to their work. You know, hmm. that's that's what excites me. It's about photographers that get under the skin of something, or try and talk about place, or a or a group of people, or you know, or both of those things intertwined and, mm. and spend time doing it. And mm. I was I was really excited by a lot of the old work that I originally saw, you know, by photographers like Eugene Smith and even Eugene Richards and mm. Trap Park and uh guy I could go on, uh Alessandra um Alessandra Sanguinetti and a lot of the a lot of those photographers that I saw and I just thought they were making really beautiful work that was really involved. And um you still think all that is still out there to shoot? Yeah, um, I mean, some of it is kind of was fifties America, I guess, wasn't it? But or sixties America. But I mean, is that is that still out there? Do you think? Yeah, there's definitely oh, still the, other, the other question that I'm always interested in: Do do, do um, people actually have to travel abroad, or is there no. a photograph in the UK? I think a lot of the best work is made on people's doorsteps, isn't it? I think, well, I think I do think that myself. Yeah, I think so. I think like look at sometimes if you look at the work that's really resonated with people, um, you know whether that be talking about older work again, I guess because that's the work that most people will know, like um, you know classic Nan Golden pictures or mm -hmm. uh, Ray Billingham or mm -hmm. uh, Larry Clark or. Um, you know, all of these, they're all, they're all, they're all photographers that were making pictures of things that they knew in their own neighborhoods or in the, yeah, their own very well. Yeah. Yeah. 
And that's what makes the work intimate and exciting, isn't it? And interesting. Um, and I, you know, I've said this before about my own work. In a lot of ways, it's just been, it's ended up just being a reflection of a lot of, in a lot of ways without sort of going too deep into that about of myself and of my own upbringing and my interests in, as I said, of hearing stories down the football when I was a young kid with my dad and, yeah. And 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 then you know trying to find belonging for different reasons and so yeah it's always been a reflection of hopefully it's always been a reflection of myself and and that's what I've always wanted it to be you know I think yeah. that's what hopefully makes the work more interesting. Yeah. What, I mean, what do you think your future might hold? I mean, do, do you think you'd ever think about editing or curating or I mean, you're interested in other people's work? Yeah, I love other people. I look at so much photography all the time and. Um, mm yeah i'd love to curate you know curate work and who knows what the, who knows what the future holds you know at the moment i'm really happy making work um yeah. and i'm really happy shooting commercially and earning a living that way and i'm balancing these two things but in the future yeah i'd love to curate work or 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 even work in a in a different creative way where i could have input on other people's or yeah. collaborate more with other working photographers which I've done before you know I set up a few years ago a collaborative project called All Change where 13 projects came together uh, 13 photographers came together and we made work all around um, yeah. all around London at the end of the underground lines which was yeah. interesting um, and it was a nice way to sort of pull different photographers together um, are, you, are you still in a kind of a network of photographers or you know if you've got if you've got three or four good friends who are photographers yeah, I've got a, yeah, uh, it's quite a small scene photography, isn't it? Really, um, I guess. Um, I guess, especially with the photographers. Although there's, it's a small scene of, of photographers that I think who are really obsessed with picture making and who seem to be everything. You know, all of the exhibitions and all the yeah, all the shows, and you, you just seem to get to know each other and each other's work quite well. Yeah. Uh, so I have, I have two or three really close friends who are photographers and we talk pretty much, you know, with a couple of them, I talk every day about photography. Yeah, I think it's really good that, isn't it? I think you can get isolated. Um, yeah, we, we bounce ideas off each other a lot and, you know, a lot of it's just about, even just about critical thinking around photography and, and what what is good about it and what, you know, what we could do better and how we can make better work. And, you know, I try to talk as to a lot of my peers as well to photographers that I look up to and try and get advice off some of those you know people have been very generous with their time who are maybe 10 or 15 years older than me or more experienced than me and yeah. you know some of them have given me invaluable advice as well and do you find sort of um, entering for bursaries or exhibitions or awards do you find that kind of helpful to your professional life you know yeah. Taylor, Taylor Wessing is you know, it's a good name, I guess. Yeah. Um, when you say to, to my professional life, I guess a lot of those are are building a building blocks, aren't they, to get your to get your name out in front of a wider audience. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, those things are great for that. Have they ever resulted in any direct commercial work? Who knows, you know? So photography career is such a, a I think a difficult career to to understand in down. In, yeah in down right you might have one chance meeting with someone that leads on to another yeah you know that leads on to another opportunity and then for example you know for example let's use this as an example apply for the joanne wakeland anniversary. that was great um managed to meet yourself um and i met fiona before very briefly um and then was awarded to make this work and then off the back of that have has the work has been maybe published now in four or five different places there's talk you know, discussing about next year making a book of the work potentially or having an exhibition of the work um so i think one thing has a knock on effect to the other and i think you know and that's the interesting thing as well about any career and definitely a career in photography is that one thing always seems to knock on to the next doesn't it and you have yeah. you might have one opportunity and that leads to another or you might make one body of work and then that inspires the next body of work that you want to make and and then it's like just about joining the dots i guess yeah 
did you find you had any advice at college for that for that for that sort of networking lifestyle if you like um advice on networking. Not lifestyle but you know that presumably i mean it seems to me you've got to be a good networker really to to actually make it uh, to make a living how you're making a living you know with a real mixture of stuff yeah know, i think there, there are yeah i think you just have to be really really hard working to be honest and i think um because I think it's a very competitive market photography. And I think, you know, as I said, it, it occupies a huge amount of my brain of photography and of my time. Um, I don't think, yeah, I don't think it was something that I was necessarily taught to go out and to network, although maybe the importance of that was talked about and maybe that did subconsciously go in somewhere. But we had a lot of great visiting lecturers. I met um, quite a lot of photographers through the people who became visiting lecturers at our university, for example, and then stayed in touch with them. Yeah. Some people were really generous with their time they gave. There's a great photographer called Robin Maddock, um, who's done a few great books. Um, one of them, Our Kids Are Going to Hell, which was about the raids in Hackney um, and this sort of interesting sort of problem that's never going to be solved. Um, and he was very generous with his time. I met him a few times in London and he sort of talked to me about photography and, and even those small conversations, you know, that they sort of blew the doors open for me about thinking more about photography and where photography could go. And it's interesting, you know, that, isn't it? Yeah. You know. It's important for people to realise that, you know, people need that input, even if it is just a couple of sentences, I suppose. Yeah, I, th I think like mentorship and conversation is so important because... And even, you know, doing things like this is I think about my own work and and then I, you know, I have my notes on my laptop or on my phone all the time open and I'm just writing things down. Yeah. Um, you know, I could, you know, I could write, I could I write pages and pages of notes just about ideas that I have about photography. And it might just be that, you know, when we've met before, we met, in the pub a couple few, a few weeks ago didn't we and it might just be one thing that you said that then i you know sparks a thought about something else in photography and then you know and that hopefully then has a knock-on effect and maybe in a year's time i'm making better pictures you know it's all about small ideas that then progress isn't it or allowing them to grow yeah i think I, I'm, a, I'm a great admirer of you that you that you can handle such a a mixture of work you know like it's such a mixture of stuff going on all the time I mean, most, you know, if you work for a newspaper, you're on a quite a straight um, railway line, if you like, it's, you know, quite a straight journey. You know, you're just, you're working for the paper, you're working for the website that day and whatever. But you seem to be able to sort of juggle a few things in a sort of, you know, completely different way. You know, this personal work and your profession and your um, advertising work seems so diff different to me. But Anyway, yeah, it's very I, guess it's, I guess it's different way. It's a different way of working, but I guess it's also interlinked. And I think, um, I, I think it's just for me. It's just always been imperative to keep making work that I that has been self motivated, and because that is essentially what gives you a voice, isn't it? Your yeah. own voice. And, other, I suppose the other thing is that, like. Um, advertising work today can be more sort of web based and sort of in, in, influencer based as well, rather than just straight still lives of wine bottles or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. We've got some questions coming in, if I can interrupt the conversation. Um, oh, firstly, please. Roger and Owen, thanks so much for, for for that conversation. And Owen, thank you for the insights into, um, I suppose, your career and, and some fabulous career advice for any students that are in, in with us this evening. Um, so one of the questions we have in from Sally is uh, saying that she saw on Instagram that you've travelled back from Japan and asking visually oh, what yeah. caught your attention and curiosity, any lingering imagery or feelings from the trip, now you're back. Oh, yeah, Japan was incredible. It was the first time I've been to Japan. And I guess the, the first thing that I was – it's so hard. I was there for 16 days, so to get – you know, as I was kind of saying to Roger earlier, to get under the skin of it, anything, you know, takes a lot longer than that, I think. And so I, I was attracted to it as a very surface level. And, 
you know, I think traveling does great things to open your eyes just to new places and to be excited. And I think, you know, so just the colors of the place, uh, the, the you know, Tokyo and Osaka, places like this are so neon lit that you feel like you're almost stepping into a different world. And then the amazing thing to me about Japan was that everything felt, you know, hidden. It was, you'd go behind any door and there was a new, you almost go into these sort of, behind these doors and there's these amazing bars or as I said, I'm massively into music and there was all these amazing tiny little jazz bars that had like such a great atmosphere. Actually, there's a great photography book, funnily enough, come out uh, that's called, um, what's it called? I think it's something, um, something jazz bars, Tokyo jazz bars or something like that. I think it's called, um, which is amazing. A photography book. I'm just, actually funny enough, just phoned the photographer's gallery today to, ask them to put a copy of that aside for me so i can go and buy it um but yeah so many things about japan which was amazing and i think sometimes as a visual person um it's so good you know to step outside of your comfort zone isn't it and just awaken your senses a little bit so yeah it was amazing um so we've got a couple uh, one question specifically around the the joan wakel anniversary project um from alex asking did hemingway's book the sun also rises inspire you with the photography project yeah um definitely um i kind of i try to look at a lot of literature and obviously a lot of work that has been made previously about the subjects um so yeah i look at all of it um at the time there was actually funny enough at the malaga bullfighting school which is the first school i went to there was an amazing exhibition on um of photographer slips on my mind now but who'd made all these amazing pictures around bullfighting before so I, I try and look at it as much as, as I can but then also go in with a very open mind as well so I think it's that balance of doing enough research that you know what you're that in that inspires you and excites you but also going in with a open enough mind that you're also open to being led down different ways of making the work and it doesn't become too repetitive so yeah um we've got a follow-up question um also from alex regarding um this sort of split between your commercial and personal work and asking did you build up a portfolio of com commercial work to pitch to brands that you kept separate from your personal work or work that you wanted to be known for um no i've always kept them really into it interlinked i guess um on my website as you can see anyone who wants to visit it it's actually just got my uh, personal work and then if you click to the commercial tab it just it goes off to my agents uh work um or their website so but yeah i'm always hoping to get commercial projects that reflect the personal work that i'm making that's always the dream um sometimes it happens you know so um but yeah when I started obviously actually I was, I was very lucky really um in some senses that I'd made this personal work and then um my current agent uh which is a company called at trailer sky uh who's a who's a great agent and she had I guess in some respects she took a bit of a risk with me you know I think she liked the work and I hadn't done a lot huge amount of commercial work at that that time and I guess she saw something in the work and liked it and and she's been supportive of it. So at the time of starting commercial work, no, I didn't have a lot of commercial work in my book. Uh, but I think that's a funny thing nowadays, isn't it, as well, is that, you know, I see it all the time, oh, well, you can't get that job unless you've got experience in that job or you can't do that, you know, if, if someone wants you to commission you to photograph oranges and you've got apples in your book, they need to see oranges. Um, but, you know, ultimately someone needs to give you their first chance and, whether that comes early or if it comes later, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully someone gives you that opportunity, I think. And, but I, for me, as a, as I've said a few times, it's always come down to the, for me, hopefully the personal, the work of the, the strength of the personal work and hopefully someone can see something in that and then think, oh, that might be applicable to what we do. Um, you know, and uh, just coming back to the bursary project, I've um, got a question asking, what's been the response from those that you photographed and their families to the work? Yeah, it's, to be honest, I, yeah, I haven't had a huge amount of um, back and forth with them since, really. 
they were quite open to the idea. At first, actually, it was it was quite difficult to gain access. But on this project, actually, which was very different than all of my previous personal work, is I actually worked with a producer who was Spanish speaking um, because I needed that because I don't speak Spanish. Um, and I don't think any of the boys that I photographed actually spoke English or very limited English. So I needed someone who could translate for me and and also arrange access. So um, so that was good. So I guess because of that language barrier, the there has been no continued relationships. Although I've, although the producer that I'm working with on this, a lady called Candy Field, who's an amazing producer, is still in touch with a lot of the people. So we can go back and continue to make the work when we need to. Um, but I believe, you know, the response from them they've been happy to see the pictures and um you know and also I think most people in my experience now is I go in to anyone's life as with a genuine interest you know so and and a real excitement to be allowed into something someone's life that I might not necessarily know and I, I hope that shows and I hope that excitement shows and so most people are quite welcoming I find um and and interestingly, I guess, which I should comment on as well, and the the response to the work from the viewers has been really mixed, you know, um, because some people, you know, understandably hate the idea of um, blood sports, especially to do, you know, especially with animals. And so it's a heavy topic, you know, but I think for me, again, good you know, good work or interesting work or work that I've always been interested in has always split the room and has always provoked conversation. And, you know, so am I upset that some people don't like the work? No, not really. Um, I think it's important that, that it starts conversation, the work starts conversation. So, uh, but equally, you know, some people have loved the work. So, yeah, I think the thing what's interesting is that both I know both the Guardian and the RPS, you know, we had some feedback, not not a massive amount, but a couple of people for each, um, you know, criticizing the work for glorifying bullfighting. But actually, I think what was interesting and I think one reason why the project was selected and Roger, jump in if you like. But one, one reason why Roger and Fiona selected the project was because actually it wasn't about bullfighting per se. It wasn't about the ring and that side of it is very much about the people in the community and those people affected by the the changing attitudes to bullfighting and where that might go into the future and I think um, certainly in your RPS journal piece you you, you noted in that that there's now I think it was a, a majority that's against bullfighting even in Spain so it may be that the you know the so-called sport is you know has only got a limited life left left anyway but I think it's very much around the social side and the, the people then that's I think the real strength of this project and I, I also think as well that's that's important to note maybe is that whether it be whether it be skinheads or whether it be lowriders or whether it be bullfighters all of those things are kind of secondary you know what is interesting to me is this pass down of heritage and this this idea of like family and belonging and what brings people together and how people find this sense of belonging mm. and these different groups that I photographed are just ways of exploration of that theme. So, you know, yeah, that that's really the interest to me. And I guess bullfighting in this case has just been the vehicle of exploring that theme yeah. further. I think that comes across really well with the the project and and the piece that you wrote accompanying it. Um, we've got a final question from Sophie, actually, which is a really nice open question, asking, do you have any dream personal projects that you want to do in the future? Um, yeah, I do have a dream personal project. Um, but I kind of don't want to talk about it too much, <laughs> <laughs> because mainly because... Um, I think if I talk about it, well, firstly, because I haven't done it yet. And secondly, I don't know if it's possible to do. Um, but I have lots of projects that I want to do for sure. And again, they all sort of go under this umbrella of these themes that I'm interested in. Um, and ultimately, though, I, I believe that most photographers, and I've said this before, um, most photographers have one good idea or one theme that they're interested in exploring through their whole career. 
And usually then there's the sort of like many variations of that theme. So I think when you do come across something that, that, you know, fits into that for me at the moment is bullfighting. It's like, take your time and make the work as good as it can be before you rush into the next one. So for now, I'm still fo- focusing on this bullfighting work mm-hmm. uh, to make it as strong as it possibly can be. Um, and then in the future, you know, hopefully I'll move on to maybe that next one. Okay, so I think we can leave, leave that one hanging so <laughs> <laughs> Um It just falls to me then really firstly to thank Roger and Fiona for selecting Owen's project. Um, and it, yeah, it's been a really interesting one to showcase in the journal and it clearly has some more mileage. So we'll look out for that potential book and, and exhibition in the future. Um, Owen, thank you so much for sharing your know, insights into your own career and specifically into this project um, and we're, we're keep an eye out in in uh, in terms of what you're, you're going to be doing in the future so thank you for that and just to end this evening um, it's a bit of a special evening in some respects because Joe McDonald who's been with the RPS for well over 20 years and has arranged this evening's talk and the whole series of awards talks that we started during the pandemic is going to be leaving the RPS just before Christmas. So I just want to pay tribute to Jo um, for all the great work that she's done with the RPS awards, with the Joan Wakelin bursary especially, and for helping bring forth um, some fabulous photographers and some of the conversations that we've hosted over the last few years. Um, I've I've learned a lot from listening to the photographers and their um, the people they've been talking to. And it's been a real pleasure working with you, Joe. So thank you so oh, much for my... everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, yeah, you. Yeah. thank you so much. Very yeah, thank you. Just to add to that, um, I'd like to say it's just been an absolute pleasure to work on on this project and obviously wouldn't have been possible to make really without the support of the Joanne Wakelin bursary, which has been, um, and, you know, Joe, Roger, Michael, the three of you have obviously been, um, you know, a huge support throughout that process and Fiona as well. Um, So, yeah, just a real pleasure and thanks for hosting this chat. It's been really nice to talk with you again, Roger, as well. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone and thanks good night and good night to our, our audience as well. Thanks everyone. Good night. Thanks. Good night.